What's good? It's Wu. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel if you were into the fight talk. We have Jerron Boots Ennis, 28 wins, zero losses, and one no contest, taking on Custio Clayton, 18 wins, zero losses, and one draw. This is the next step up fight for one of the most sensational talents at least as far as we're seeing thus far, one of the most promising and electrifying young talents in the sport, Jerome Boots Ennis. Custio Clayton kind of represents the next step up opponent for him, although I don't know that Custio Clayton is better than Jerome Boots Ennis' last two step up opponents in Thomas DeLorme and uh, Sergey Lipinets. What I do know is Custio Clayton in October of 2020, this is just before Lipinets fought Jerome, Jerome Boots Ennis, Custio Clayton unexpectedly fought Sergey Lipinets to a majority draw. This is like in October 2020 when they were first bringing, you know, more and more of the fights back to crowdless environments. Well, Sergey Lipinets, you know, kind of underachieved relative to Custio Clayton, who again, fought the favorite Lipinets to a draw. But Jerron Boots Ennis, you know, he's the son of Derek Bozy Ennis, a former professional fighter who is now Jerron, his son's trainer. And, you know, Ennis fight after fight is just displaying some of the most physically gifted attributes that you can imagine in the sport of boxing. Like if you were to create a fighter, like a, a video game style where you're kind of cranking up certain attributes, the fact that he's able to let his hands go, we don't know yet totally about the chin. We saw him get hit by a couple of Sergey Lipinets' right hands, Jerome Boots Ennis did. So we don't know completely about the chin. We don't know about you know the durability round after round. We don't know about a lot of the intangibles. What we do know is he is like in the A plus upper upper tier in terms of being able to just, in layman's terms, Break out a can of whoop ass. That's what I know he can do. And he, he switches stances. And just when you think you, that maybe turtling up and just kind of putting your guard up and taking a step back will make you a little bit safer. No, he'll open up with like a six punch fast combination where his hooks are getting around your guard. His straight punches are getting through the guard. He's throwing uppercuts to go under the guard. And like may, maybe worse than all of these... He will switch to southpaw and use his right jab to just set up a, a, a very mean, borderline cruel, straight left hand to the body. And by the second round of Ennis versus Sergey Lipinets, you saw this like look of discouragement when Ennis set Lipinets up and just blasted him with, again, a long, straight left hand to the belly area. That just had Lipinets taking a step back, kind of move in to catch his breath and then try to get back into the fight. And Sergey Lipinets, a former belt holder at, you know, 140, was pretty game. And, you know, some thought that he might present a challenge for Jerron Ennis, you know, just because of what we had seen in him, you know, stopping Lamont Peterson, basically retiring him. Granted, Lamont Peterson was kind of on his way out, an aging fighter already. But Lipinets also had a competitive unanimous decision loss against Mikey Garcia down at 140, where again, Lipinets held the 140 pound IBF title. Mikey Garcia took that away from him, dropped him in the fight, and ended up winning via unanimous decision. So we had seen Lipinets, and we, you know, looked at him as a pretty high quality fighter. I think that at a point he was even flirting with like the bottom of the top 10 in terms of the ring rankings at the welterweight division, one of the best divisions in, in boxing. And Jerron Ennis is looking so talented that although he's just cracking, you know, the rank five and six, although I think Virgil Ortiz should be ranked one spot spot above Jerron Ennis rather than one spot below Ennis, basically because he's fought Mean Machine Kavayaskis and Maurice Hooker, whereas Jerron Ennis's best wins are against uh, Sergey Lipinets and Thomas DeLorme. I just think uh, Virgil Ortiz Jr. at this point has shown us a little bit more, but right now Jerron Ennis is actually ranked one step above Virgil Ortiz Jr. at 147. Right now Ennis is actually ranked four and Virgil Ortiz Jr. is ranked five. Keep in mind, number one, two, and three are Errol Spence, Terrence Crawford, and Jordanis Ugas. We just had a bunch of like exits from the rankings because one, Sean Porter retired, uh, two, Manny Pacquiao retired, and uh, Danny Garcia hasn't fought in a while and is you know talking about fighting perhaps at 154. And Keith Thurman, who would have occupied one of these top three, four spots, 
has basically been out of action, although he did come back to fight Mario Barrios. Right now, Keith Thurman is sitting at number seven. So even with the lack of beating good fighters, and I'm talking about top eight, top ten in the division type fighters, Jerron Boots Ennis already finds himself number four. And that's largely because the talent is just jumping off the screen. Not many people can let their hands go like he does. And, you know, like just one of his several punches looks like a Ryan Garcia level left hook, for instance. Yes, he also has a nice straight right. Yes, he also puts different trajectories and loops on certain punches. So he mixes up how he throws every left hand and right hand. But just his left hook alone looks like it's like Ryan Garcia level pound for pound, just in terms of how quick it's released and the impact that it seems to have when he lands it. So yeah, Jerron Boots Ennis is definitely one of the fighters that people are getting the most excited about. In fact, in a perfect boxing world, matchups wise, you would be able to make a fight between two of the best up and coming prospects at turn contenders, Jerron Ennis and Virgil Ortiz Jr. They're both knocking on the doors and are actually mandatories for some of the sanctioning bodies. But I assume that those belts are going to be tied up in hopefully a long awaited, frustratingly awaited showdown between the two sensational champions in the division, Errol Spence Jr., who's holding three of the belts, and then Terrence Crawford, who's holding the other title. So I don't expect, you know, Stanley Onis, Virgil Ortiz Jr., or Jerron Boone. And is to be fighting for a title just yet, but there are some people who think that Jerron Boots Ennis is already ready to fight one of those two guys and to compete and potentially win against one of those guys. And he's only 24 years old and he's about he's about five foot ten. I tend to believe that he's got to experience a bit more before he's ready to jump in with one of those proven generationally great talents, Errol Spence and Terrence Crawford. I don't think he's quite ready, but that just tells you the level of talent that he's displaying and people's confidence and belief that, hey, this guy might be a, might be the truth. Him and Virgil Ortiz Jr., I think, are both knocking on the door and are, I think would both be game opponents against both of those guys. But Jerome Boots Ennis knocked Sergey Lipinitz out in the sixth round and he hit him with everything but the kitchen sink. If it wasn't for Lipinitz like gameness and toughness, he would have been out by like the third or fourth round because Jerome Boots Ennis was really pouring it on by the third round, and it, it was already starting to look like a mismatch. And you know, he's he's listed at 5'10", Lipidus is 5'7", Custio Clayton is about 5'9", but Jerome Boots Ennis, in the way that he fights, it looks like he's taller than he is. Like, he might have just had like a three inch height advantage over Sergey Lipidus, but because of the 74 inch reach, it just, it seemed like the effective height difference looked like it was like four to five inches just because again of the way that he's not like somebody who's moving around the ring a ton he's kind of more of a step and slider rather than somebody who bounces around but his control of distance and his ability to throw long punches mid-range punches and short punches just makes him an absolute handful to deal with and so his most recent fight the one fight after the knockout of Sergey Lipinitz was against Thomas Delorme and he knocked him out in the first round it was a little bit controversial Thomas Delorme they actually filed to get the decision or the knockout ruling overturned citing that he was hit like in the back of the head with like an illegal punch it's debatable. It was kind of like upper back, ear, head area. So it's definitely a spot where if you get hit there, it's going to probably rock your equilibrium pretty badly. And, and it obviously had a pretty dramatic impact on Thomas Delorme. You know, I really wanted to see how that fight was going to play out if it went some rounds because that's what I've been wanting to see from Ennis. I mean, yes, you know, Sergey Lipinis made it to the sixth round, but, you know, aside from a few nice punches from Lipinis, Ennis was dominating that fight, and then he stopped. Uh, he knocked uh, Juan Abreu out in the sixth round, and then all of his fights before that were either knockouts by the fourth round or earlier. Think about that. Out of his 28 wins, 26 came via knockout, and the only two that went to decisions were uh, a six-rounder back in 2017 and then a four-rounder back in 2016. So, yeah, these fights of his aren't going very long. So I wanted to see how Thomas Delorme, who's fought some of the best. You know, he's fought a lot of people. He, he had fought a very competitive fight with uh, Iamontis Stanionis, who we just saw 
beat Butayev in that kind of, you know, il title eliminator style fight. Danny Onis, by the way, is another one of those prospects turn contenders that you need to keep your eye on. I thought that, you know, Danny Onis and Butayev could have pretty much gone either way. I picked Danny Onis via close decision and he did win via decision, but that was, you know, in my view, a very dangerous fight for Danny Onis. But Thomas Delorme, yeah, he made it the full 12 round distance against Stanley Onis. He fought a competitive fight against Jamal James, 12 round decision loss, pretty close fight. He went the distance against Jordanus Ugas and he went six rounds way back in 2015 against Terrence Crawford. Again, he didn't make it past the first round, controversy or not against Jerome Boots Ennis. So that's what we're dealing with as we lead into this Jerome Boots Ennis versus Custio Clayton fight. And Custio Clayton is an undefeated fighter. He hasn't fought any, you know, top tier competition aside from that majority draw with Sergey Lipinitz. Yes, he did fight, you know, former champ Demarcus Chop Chop Corley, but like Demarcus Corley has to be pushing like 50 years old now, if not already. He fought him just a couple years ago. Damn, Corley is still fighting. That's amazing. And if you look at his recent fights, I mean, the, the record is not looking good. He lost his last four fights, and but only one of those fights was via stoppage, and that was his final fight against Custio Clayton, and that was back in 2019. So maybe De I think Demarcus Corley might actually be retired. I know he fought a bare knuckle fight like uh, early in 2021, so I hope he's retired. But Custio Clayton's style is a He's pretty patient. He's good at controlling distance. Again, he's about 5'9", so that's pretty much par for the course in the 147-pound division. But he's like a step and slider, although his gait, when he steps and his stance, is not as wide as Jerron Ennis. You know, he's an intelligent footwork, patient pressure fighter. Keeps He doesn't keep a high guard, but he's able to put his hands up at the right time. He faints pretty well, changes levels, and he's, again, very calculated, and then he'll let his hands go when the opportunity presents itself. But he's one of those guys who's kind of taking a step forward, taking a step forward. Then when he looks at, you know, your shoulders or upper body and senses that you're throwing a punch, then he'll already anticipate and start moving with it or moving away from it and then keep on applying this intelligent, patient pressure and then look to jab to the body, changing, again, levels high and low, both with his feints and his upper body kind of doing the dips and throwing the jabs high and low. So he pretty much keeps the opponent stuck in like first or second gear. They're not able to do what they want against Clayton because of his uh, distance management and his intelligent defensive fighting, good counter punching, and then when he uh, finds the opportunity to come forward and start throwing the jab to then open up power punches. He'll throw a nice little digging hook to the body. He'll throw a sweeping right hand to the body, throw a nice straight right hand, and a pretty nice looping overhand right hand on on occasion but it's mostly the jab and then he's going to throw the the right hand to then try to dig hard with the left hook off into the body sometimes up top though and he does have pretty good power and he carries that power late into fights Unlike Jerome Buzanis, Cusio Clayton has a lot of late round experience. In his last fight against Cameron Crail, he went the full 10 rounds in a unanimous decision win. Again, he fought that 12 round majority draw against Lipinitz, and he uh, knocked Diego Ramirez out in the eighth round. He actually knocked him out with a jab to the body. Think about that. And it, it was a little bit like Jermel Charlo's jab to Jason Rosario's body, but it actually looked like more of a common jab. It was weird. He just, yeah, he just changed levels, jabbed. Again, that's the effectiveness of somebody thinking that you're going high and then you instead go low. Now, Castillo Clayton did that, and again, he stopped Diego Ramirez with that jab to the body. And again, he does have a lot of late round experience. Johan Perez, 10 uh, round unanimous decision win. But for as well as Clayton is able to mix up the attack and throw that unexpected, off time sometimes, jab to the body, Jerome Buzanis does that even nastier. And he'll do it again with the jab, but he'll do it switching stances and again, look to splash you with a straight left hand. Look, it's bad enough when you're fighting a southpaw and you have to get used to the fact that the guy you were just fighting in an orthodox stance for the first whole round or first two rounds, then switches to southpaw, kind of like Terrence Crawford, and then you've got to start dealing with those new angles, ask Kell Brook. But the fact that Jerron Boos Ennis is as likely to blast you with a straight left to the body as he is a right hook up top, that, again, just makes him an absolute handful, especially when you factor in the 74-inch reach and the speed of these punches and his 
willingness to throw combinations. Like some of the times that he got clipped by Sergey Lipinitz, it's because he was willing to let a, you know, three, four, five punch combination go. So Jerome Boots Ennis versus Castillo Clayton, I have been unable to find any betting odds on this fight. If you've seen any odds, please let me know in the comments what those betting odds are. Uh, you know, I looked at a few of the sites that I normally go to to see how these fight handicaps are shaping up, and I, I just haven't seen anything as it pertains to Ennis versus Clayton. I would imagine it's pretty wide because I'm sure if you were to pull 50 boxing fans, who's going to win? Jerome Boos Ennis or Custio Clayton? You know, 48, 49 of them are likely going to say Jerome Boos Ennis, if not more. It might be all 50 people that you ask. So I'd imagine that if or when betting odds do present themselves, they're going to be pretty heavily skewed in Ennis's favor, which is interesting because we are dealing with a apparently good undefeated Custio Clayton, who again is showing a lot of the sweet science aspects in the game. So at the very least, I hope to see this fight go a few rounds so we could tell us a lot more about Jerome Boots Ennis as, you know, that initial burst of activity and, you know, the adrenaline in those early rounds and the, the fighter operating when they're at 100% in cardio and you don't really see them getting dragged into the deeper waters where they're starting to breathe heavier, where plan A might not be working as well as they wanted it to. I would like to see how Jerron Boots Ennis responds to those circumstances, but in Ennis versus Custio Clayton, I think it's going to go some rounds. I think Clayton is going to have his moments, but I think at the end of the day, once Jerome Boots Ennis starts taking more and more liberties to the body to slow the patient stocking movement of Custio Clayton down, who, by the way, Clayton can also fight backing up a little bit. He can step and slide going backwards, where if you're starting to stalk him, he can take start backing up and then take an angle and throw a nice counter punch and defend himself intelligently. I think that he's going to find himself being too patient with Jerome Boots Ennis, and Ennis is going to start letting his hands go, and it's going to start accumulating into more and more unanswered activity. I think that you're going to see the dominance early from Ennis. I think Clayton's going to survive that early onslaught. Then I think it's going to sort, sort of not even out, but just get a little bit slower and a little bit more competitive, maybe by the third or fourth round. But I think that by the sixth, seventh, and eighth round, you're going to start seeing Ennis start to pour it on more and more, and you're going to see less and less output from Custio Clayton, which is interesting because it is Clayton who has a late round experience. But again, Jerome Boots Ennis is just looking that damn good. So we'll see how he handles the middle to late rounds if this fight reaches that against Custio Clayton. But I'm taking Jerron Boots Ennis via, I'll say maybe 7th, 8th, ninth round stoppage, basically in that pocket of the fight. I think Custio Clayton's going to make it out of the first half of the fight. But yeah, let me know what you think about this one in the comments. If Jerron Boots Ennis handles business against Custio Clayton, where do you think he should go from this point? He is on PBC. They do have 90, 95%, the great lion's share of the talent, top tier talent at 147. Who would you like to see Jerron Ennis fight after Clayton, assuming that he's not going to get a mandatory title shot against Spence or Crawford? Because again, we are hoping that we see Errol Spence Jr. versus Terrence Crawford late 2022. But yeah, let me know what you think of the comments. Like the video, subscribe to the channel. If you are into the fight talk, I'm Wook. Thanks for tuning in.